the door opens and then slams shut. A gust of cold air rushes through the house and a black mass manifests from the floor and enters the ceiling. You hear children laughing on the stairs, banging from the bedroom. A man appears and looks at you with a cold, dark stare. You run out of the house, never to return. Welcome to a Halloween special episode of Ghost Tales by the Fireside. I am Clem Dalloway, and this episode is about the witchcraft trials in England and a haunted house in Essex called The Cage, which was once a small prison that held people accused of witchcraft while awaiting trial. During the reign of Henry VIII, in 1542, the Witchcraft Act, England's first witchcraft law, was passed. At this time, if convicted, it didn't always result in a death sentence until the reign of Elizabeth I, when in 1563, an act against conjurations, enchantments and witchcraft was passed, which meant that anyone using witchcraft to kill or harm others would face the death sentence. In July 1566, Chelmsford held the first major witch trial where four women stood accused. Laura Winchester, mother and daughter Agnes and Joan Waterford and Elizabeth Francis, all from Hatfield, Peverell. Agnes was the only one given the death sentence which made her the first person in England to be put to death for witchcraft. The witch trials continued until the 18th century and around 500 of the accused had been killed, 90% of them being women. In September 1589, James VI of Scotland's wife, Anne of Denmark, was travelling across the North Sea to join him and to be crowned queen, when a devastating storm capsized one of the ships, and the ship that Anne was travelling in had to retreat back to Denmark. James decided to go and meet his wife in Copenhagen in January 1590, and his journey was almost as bad. Violent storms nearly made him turn back. While in Denmark, two people were accused of causing the storms by use of witchcraft. They both confessed and five others were also convicted, all burned at the stake. Witch hunt mania was all over mainland Europe and hundreds of people had been accused of witchcraft and killed, which would escalate into the thousands. The witch hunts were caused because of a book written in 1487 by a German monk named Heinrich Kramer. The book was called The Malleus Maleficarum, or The Hammer of the Witches. The contents of the book explained how to identify a witch, how to make them confess, and how to execute them. King James of Scotland became aware of this and wrote a book himself called Demonology, which became very popular in England after the death of his cousin, Elizabeth I, when he took over the English throne and became James I of England in 1603. James was convinced that witches were out to kill him after a case in Edinburgh in 1590. In 1590, the deputy bailiff in Edinburgh, David Seaton, claimed that his housemaid, Glynis Duncan, was a witch. He said that she suddenly had a healing powers and he'd seen her sneaking out at night. Her master began to grow very inquisitive and examined her. 
which way and matters of so great importance. Whereat she gave him no answer. Nevertheless, her master to the intent that he might the better tire and find out the truth of the same, did with the help of others torment her and the torture of the pillywinkles upon her fingers. Gillis was tortured with pillywinkles, thumbscrews that crush the bones of the fingers. She still didn't confess to something that she hadn't done. He then wrenched her, a torture process where a rope was tied tightly around her head and pulled tight until the skull fractured and she would have received terrible rope burns across her face. She still wouldn't confess, so he searched her body for a mark that had been left by the devil. This could have been anything from a birthmark or a mole. He found a mark on her neck and she then confessed. Most likely because she couldn't take any more torture and she knew she'd die. Her confession would lead to the death of many more innocent people over the next hundred years. In November of 1590, Gillis was taken to the old Tollbath prison in Edinburgh, where she confessed to being part of a coven. She also gave the names of another eight witches. Each one of these named more people, and in total over a hundred people were tortured. Glynis also said that her coven had been working with the witches in Copenhagen, who had been executed for trying to murder King James and his wife, Anne of Denmark. Because of this, James got involved. Glynis named a woman called Agnes Samson, a midwife from Edinburgh, as the head of the coven, who, while under torture, confessed to attempting to murder King James using witchcraft. James interrogated her himself and didn't believe her until she started repeating a private conversation between him and Anne on their wedding night. This convinced James and he ordered to have her executed by being burned at the stake along with other witches on the 28th of January 1591 at Castle Hill in Edinburgh. Seventy of the convicted people were found guilty and sentenced to death. Glynis Duncan stayed in jail for another year before being executed. In Essex, England, lies a village called St. Osith, where in 1581 a young boy was taken very ill and his mother called for the local wise woman, Ursula Kemp, to help. The mother's name was Grace Thurlow, and her son's name was Davy Thurlow. Ursula visited Grace's house and performed a ritual on Davy, and he became better overnight. Grace was heavily pregnant at the time, and Ursula presumed that she would be asked to assist Grace when she gives birth, but Grace had told Ursula that she'd arranged for someone else to help her. Ursula was offended that she wasn't asked, and the two women argued. Grace threatened Ursula that she would tell the magistrate, and that she'd bewitched her, and was the cause of her lame leg, but Ursula wasn't bothered at all. Ursula then asked Grace if she would like her help to nurse the baby and in doing so she would also cure Grace's lame leg in which Grace told her that she'd be nursing the baby herself. Sadly, after three months of giving birth the baby fell from her cot and broke her neck. When Ursula found out she responded by saying that it wouldn't have happened if she was nursing the baby. Not long after, Grace's leg became much worse, 
barely being able to stand, but Ursula offered to help her for 12 pence. Grace took her up on the offer, as she was in so much pain. Ursula cured Grace's leg and returned five weeks later to collect the money, but Grace said that she couldn't afford to pay her. Ursula left in anger, and as soon as she left, Grace's leg became lame again. The pain became worse than it ever had been before. Grace claimed that she managed to treat her leg herself, but every time it started to feel better, her son Davy would become ill again. And when Davy got better, Grace would be in pain again. In February of 1582, Grace Thurlow went to Brian Darcy, who was the Justice of the Peace, and she accused Ursula of causing the death of her baby, causing her son to be ill and for making her leg lame by using witchcraft. Other people from the village also spoke out about Ursula, including her own son, eight-year-old Thomas Kemp, who told the jury that his mother kept four familiars, which he described as a grey cat called Tiffin, a white lamb called Titty, a black toad called Piggin, and a black cat called Jack. He also told the jury that he'd seen his mother feed them beer and cake and let them suck blood from her own body. She was held at a local lockup known as The Cage until March of 1582, when she was transferred to Colchester Jail. After being tortured, Ursula accused other people from the village of witchcraft, who were also held at the cage or being interrogated, before some of them being taken to Colchester to be tried. Ursula was found guilty and sentenced to hang in the same year. In 2004, a house came up for sale in St. Oswith. A woman who grew up in the area bought the house, knowing its history as the local medieval lockup, known locally as the cage, which was still being used as a small prison until 1908. As soon as she moved in, she started to experience strange things. Door handles would move, the kettle would turn itself on, doors would open and shut, and taps would turn on. She was sitting on the floor in the living room when a woman dressed in old-fashioned clothes walked across the room, carrying a wooden bowl. She could see what looked like crushed herbs in the bowl, and as she approached the owner, the apparition sprinkled some of the herbs onto her head. After a while, the new owner didn't mind any of what she'd been experiencing, as it made a talking point when friends and family visited. Many of them seeing some of these things happening for themselves, many of them not visiting again. She started experiencing more and more paranormal activity. She would hear the sound of children playing, talking, laughing, and often running up and down the stairs. One day, she was sitting in the living room when a man walked past her. She described him as having long black hair and that he smiled, but she was only able to see him from the waist up. Things started to become more malevolent. One day, a huge dark mass came up from the floor and went through the ceiling and this would start happening on a day-to-day -day basis. She was brushing her teeth one morning when she was hit by an unseen force, as if somebody had punched her. She was pregnant and doing her day-to-day -day chores around the house when she was pushed over by an incredible force. Two close friends visited one day, one a nurse and the other an ex-soldier. After they'd walked in, one of them noticed blood marks on the wooden floor in the living room. 
He examined it and it was wet blood. Like something bad had just happened. After her baby was born, she was too afraid to leave him alone in any part of the house. It was around six o'clock one evening and the baby was asleep in the bedroom. She needed to iron some clothes for work for the next day. So took advantage while the baby was sleeping. The ironing board was in the prison room, so she went in and started ironing. Some of the baby's toy trains were left on the floor when they suddenly started moving around her feet as if someone was playing with them. She was terrified. She turned off the iron, grabbed the clothes and headed towards the stairs. As she reached the stairs, she looked up and a man was standing on them. He was wearing brown trousers and a white shirt, modern day clothes. Things became so bad that she lived in just one bedroom in the house. She would make her food at work and eat it in there. The noise was becoming unbearable. Men, women and children talking, banging up and down the stairs, children playing, and a loud whisper constantly repeating, kill yourself. After three years, she finally moved out and the house stood empty, only being used for paranormal investigations. In 2019, the house was cleansed by two members of the clergy and it calmed down. She started going in the house again, but her presence still remained. The house was sold in 2020 and has now closed its doors to the public. If you'd like to find out more about the witch trials in England, I do recommend a book named England's Witchcraft Trials by Willow Winsham, which includes the story of Ursula Kemp. Thank you for listening. You can find us on the Facebook page, facebook.com Ghost Tales Podcast. You can also find us on Instagram, instagram.com Ghost Tales Podcast. This podcast will be out monthly and is available on most podcast platforms. All music, research, writing, production, art and sound effects are my own work. Ghost